invite you to turn within your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. We'll be looking at verses 20 to 25. We are going to finish today. It's, it's a miracle, I know. G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton made this statement. Whatever else is said of man, this much is clear. He is not what he is capable of being. He is not what he is capable of being. A general statement about humanity, we none of us perhaps live up to our full potential, but as we'll see in a few moments, how much more true would that be for us as believers? You know, we've had several appliances at the house replaced in the last couple of years. Uh, we, we bought a 20-year-old house, and so the appliances were 20 years old. and So we've had to replace a range, a dishwasher, a, a washing machine. Now imagine that you went to replace your refrigerator. Since this new refrigerator is going to serve you for years to come, you go and you, you buy the top of the line with all the bells and whistles. It, it can do everything but turn out the lights for you. Uh, it, 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 it just falls short of taking out the trash and walking the dog. It, I mean, it does all kind of stuff. You can control things from your phone, whatever. You're so excited when this thing arrives that you go to the grocery store to stock it with food. But when you wake up the next morning, have installed the, having, installed, having had the refrigerator installed, your food is spoiled and your frozen goods have all melted. It's not working. So you call up customer support, and the person on the other end listens patiently and very kindly, as you would hope that customer service person would do all the time, right? But they're really listening, trying to diagnose the issue, but nothing's working. Finally, he gives you one more set of instructions, and he says, would you please open the refrigerator and see if the light comes on? You do, and it doesn't. He said, okay, would you put your ear up to the refrigerator and see if you can hear the motor running? You do, and, it, and you can't. Sir, ma'am, would you, would you just pull the refrigerator out and check behind it and just ensure, I'm sure it is, but just ensure that it's plugged up? You do, and it ain't. Embarrassed, you tell the worker that after all the money you spent on the refrigerator, it should still be working. Anyway. That's how many Christians live. There is power. The appliance works. But unless you connect the potential to the power, you've got nothing. You see, there's power to be had in Christ. We just sang about in Christ, in Christ alone. But we don't plug in to what's already ours in Him. And so this morning we come to wrap up our study of the book of Hebrews. We've been looking at this book. This will be our 30th time together. And um, uh, we've been looking at this book under under the title of Don't Forget Who Jesus Is. And and can I just say that that's the connection. Remembering and believing who He is. Because who He is is sufficient for everything we need. Peter would say, for life and godliness and our knowledge of Him. It's the remembering who He is and not forgetting who He is and then living in light of who He is that makes the connection. This morning, as we come to Hebrews 13, 20 to 25, we see in these verses a prayer and an appeal for perseverance. Here's the truth I want you to take home with you this morning. God will equip and empower us to do His will if we ask Him and pursue obedience. God will. There's not a, there's not a problem with the equipping and the empowerment for what He's called us to do. The problem is us connecting to it. God will equip and empower us to do His will if we ask Him and pursue obedience. Hebrews 13, verse 20, verses 20 and 21 are what 
we would call a benediction, more about that later, now made the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Aren't you glad? You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders. And all the saints, interestingly enough, there again, that reference to leaders, the third one in the chapter, those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with all of you. Now, this morning, we're not really going to look at verses 23 to 25, okay? We can talk about that on Wednesday night. That can be discussed in our See for Yourself Bible study at 6.30 on Wednesday nights, this Wednesday night. But I want us to skip down to verse 22 first. And I want to look at the closing appeal the author of Hebrews gives before we back up and look at the benediction that he gives, the prayer that he prays. In verse 22, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. In essence, what the author of Hebrews is saying in in that simple appeal is, I want you to take my message to heart. Now, now I've I've not said everything I could have said, I've basically written this word of exhortation down on paper. I've I've preached this message on paper. I've preached this sermon on paper to you. And I want you to take it to heart. I want you to live it out in your life. I've proven to you in this letter over and over and over again that Jesus is what? Have you been paying attention? Jesus is what? Oh, boy. Jesus is better, y'all. Y'all remember that word better? Over and over and over. Some 25 times we have some sort of wording that says Jesus is better 13 times or more than, greater than. He's better. And he's God's last and conclusive word of revelation. And because Jesus is better, the author is saying, you are infinitely and eternally blessed in him and his finished work of salvation for you through his perfect life, his eternal sin atoning sacrifice, and his victorious resurrection from the dead that defeated death. We've seen in the book of Hebrews, he is the perfect priest, the final sacrifice, the perfect intercessor, the king of peace. And Jesus is the mediator of the new and eternal covenant with the true eternal people of God from all nations who believe He he is who God has said that He is. And we, as the church, are the true temple, the new Jerusalem. We're living in an unshakable kingdom so that we will forever dwell in the presence of God in that eternal city where the the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple and the Lamb is its light. And we will see His face, Revelation 20 says, and His name shall be on our foreheads. There will be no night there. There They need no lamp nor light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light and we shall reign forever and ever. Bear with my word of exhortation. Remember what I've told you. Listen to the sermon I've preached and let it change your life. Don't forget who Jesus is. Remember who he is and live like it. So we should live today in light of that eternity that's ours. We should trust and obey Jesus, especially the Great Commission, no matter what. Gladly bearing whatever, as chapter 13 says, reproach may come because we follow him. Because we know who our Savior is, whose we are, and what our certain and eternal hope is. Now let's back up and see the prayer for God's blessing that the author of Hebrews prays for his reader and one that God will answer for us. Verse 20, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of 
the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may also do his that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now this prayer is, is, we call it a benediction. It's an invocation of blessing. It's a prayer for a blessing on the people to whom he's writing. Meaning that the author is appealing to God to bestow a certain blessing on the readers. Someone has said the author of Hebrews invokes the power of God to bless the people of God to make them pleasing to God for the glory of the Son of God. And that's really what those two verses are all about. The writer of this letter summarizes and wraps up his sermon in this beautiful benediction for his readers and for us, and, 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 and it includes four wonderful truths that I want you to see in this prayer. First of all, from verse 20, what the God of peace has done for you through Jesus Christ. I want you to see what the God of peace has done for you through Jesus Christ. Now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. What we can see very quickly and very, very clearly just in the reading of this verse is this. God has given us peace with him through the sin-atoning death and death-defeating resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ. What has the God of peace done for you through Jesus Christ? Well, what the author of Hebrews wants you to leave and finish this letter out remembering, having at the forefront of your mind is the fact that God has given you peace with him through the sin atoning death and death defeating resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have peace with God through Jesus Christ. We who were enemies are now called sons and daughters of the living God. We who were without hope and without God, in fact, we were under the condemnation of holy and just God because of all of our sin. We now are His children. Uh, that phrase, that statement, you have peace with God, it's a huge statement. It's one you and I don't hear because we've heard it so much. Don't ever let that grow old. Train yourself to stop and realize what's actually being said when you hear those words. You, a sinner, one who is undeserving of any audience with the Holy One, have peace with Him because Jesus died in your place. What the God of peace has done for us, He's given us peace with Himself. Through the sin-atoning death and death-defeating resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2 talks about this. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We, we read about it as we studied through in cha Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. There it's, it's said, it, uh, the author of Hebrews tells us, Since therefore the children, that's us, share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those, that's us, who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. He has defeated death. You have peace with God. And that means you don't have to fear death anymore because here's the deal. Your body's going to die, but you're not going to die. You're going to forever live with Him. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 33. Before, before I read that, let me just comment on, on one other thing in this passage. So there in verse 20 it says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, He, rose, he, he raised Him from the dead, Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, that, that actually, guys, connects back to the phrase about bringing him again from the dead. In other words, Jesus could not have been raised from the dead unless he had been that perfect sin-atoning sacrifice for sin. He had to have paid the price for sin, whose penalty is death, 
to overcome death. And the fact that God raised him up from the dead was God saying, Jesus paid it all. We just sang it. Joe, where'd he go? Ain't it wild how it works? Sometimes. Jesus paid it all. And therefore God raised him from the dead. Jesus said it is finished. And in the resurrection, God said, it sure is. Paid in full. And in, over, in paying the price for sin, he, was, he is now able to be the victor and is the victor over death. He raised him up from the dead by the blood of the eternal covenant. In Jeremiah 31, we have a reference about, there about that, uh, uh, the mention of that eternal covenant. In fact, all throughout the book of uh, the New Testament and, and right here in the book of Hebrews, there's a reference, indirect at least, an allusion to Jeremiah 31 about the eternal covenant. V verse 31 of chapter 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, a prophecy. Now remember, hundreds of years before the time of Christ, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. We've learned something about that in, in the book of Hebrews, haven't we? And the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their, their God, and they shall be my people. That prophecy about the new covenant is fulfilled in the true Israel called the church, believers in Jesus Christ, the world over. In our hearts, in your heart, in our lives, as a church, this eternal covenant has come in and through the life, death, and resurrection and reign of Jesus Christ. And we who trust in Jesus, we're partakers of this covenant. He is our God and we will forever be his people. This is what God, what the God of peace has done for you through Jesus Christ. He's given you peace with himself through the shed blood of Christ. And in the resurrection, he has, he, has, he, has, he has brought you into the eternal, everlasting, new covenant. But notice with me, secondly, this morning, who Jesus Christ is to you. Who Jesus Christ is to you. Now, we've seen who Jesus Christ is all through the book of uh, Hebrews, haven't we? We've seen the author of Hebrews show us many things. He is our great high priest. He is the Lamb of God. He is the temple. You, you name it. He, he's he, he, he's, he's a, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. I mean, we could go on and on and on. But here, the, the title, the, the relationship he wants us to leave thinking about. When we think of who Jesus is to us, is this in verse 20. Our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. That's how he wants us to remember Jesus as we close this letter. Jesus is your great shepherd. And we are forever his sheep. It's good to be a sheep in Jesus' flock. Amen? Now you realize when you amen that, what you're saying is it's good to be a dumb, needy sheep. You remember what Paul said? Jesus taught him that lesson about his, about his grace being sufficient. So what did Paul say? Paul said, I'm going to go around saying that's good to be a sheep. I'm going to go around boasting in my weakness because in my weakness, he, his power is made perfect. So if you don't like being a sheep, you've got a real problem following Jesus. You don't like admitting you're dumb and needy and spiritually bankrupt without Jesus, that's a real problem. Because that's the only kind of folks that get in the flock. You follow me? It's, it's just, just it's, it's criteria for entrance. But what a privilege to have Jesus as our great shepherd. Ezekiel prophesied about Jesus being your shepherd. In Ezekiel 34, verses 11 and 12, and some other verses, I'm just going to read really quickly here, or we'll be here all day. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, 
will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all places where they've been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. Verse 15, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. What does it mean that he's a great shepherd, a good shepherd? That's what it means. Verse 23, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. Who do you think that's talking about? David? No, it's talking about the son of David, whose name is Jesus. And he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. Hundreds of years before Jesus came, the, through the prophet Ezekiel, God said, here's the deal, Israel. You've got a bunch of bad shepherds. A bunch of unfaithful priests in the land. But there's going to be a day when I expand beyond the nation of Israel, it's always been my plan is to build the true Israel from the nations. And I'm going to set the son of David over them. And I'm going to give them a shepherd. His name's Jesus. He will be the great shepherd of my eternal people from Jews and Gentiles alike, the church. And so it is. And here we are. And here the author of Hebrews says... Jesus, who is he to you? He's that great shepherd of the sheep. He's your great shepherd. You're never alone. You know the thing about sheep? There's, there's a problem if a sheep is alone. Something's happened. But good shepherds don't let their sheep be alone. They're with them. They, they know they have to watch them. Because sheep, the Chad Kellys of the world of the church, we're too stupid to stay where we ought to stay and do what we ought to do and stay safe. Spiritually, we roam. He has to come after us and pull us back. Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. You're never alone. He's watching over you. He's tending to you. He watches through the night over your life. It's Him that orchestrates the circumstances of your life at points to bring you back on the right track. It's Him that, by His Holy Spirit, convicts you when you go astray. It's Him that comforts you when you're hurting. It's Him that's there in the darkness and you're, and you're scared. It's, it, it's Him that's there for whatever the need, with the healing, with the comfort, with the tender touch of a shepherd. He's there to bind up your wounds when sin, your sin, injures you, which it always does. He's there for you. Jesus said this of himself in John 10. The thief, again thinking about a flock of sheep, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Never forget that about the devil. And sin. Always that's what He's about. That's always what sin does. But then Jesus said, I came that they, who's that? That's me, that's you. That they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And he literally did. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life, second time he said it, for the sheep. And I love this. As he talks to Jewish hearers at this point, he goes on and says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice so there will be one flock and one Shepherd, what's he talking about? He's talking about Gentiles like me. Aren't you glad that God's plan of salvation has always included the world? And he said, guys, here's the deal. You, you, these Jews, they, they, thought, they thought it was just about Israel. It wasn't just about Israel. Just the beginning. In fact, it was only about the Jews who trusted Jesus as Messiah that would be considered true Jews, the Bible says, all across the New Testament. 
And you and I are, spiritually speaking, we are the children of Abraham, Paul says. When we trust in Jesus. We are the true Israel. That's all, that, that true Israel of God, combined, made up of Jews and Gentiles alike, has always been the plan of God. Always. And we are that flock. The one flock. You know, Paul said in one place, there was a dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles. But, but Jesus tore it down. Because in Christ's coming, Jesus basically said to the world, you're all sinners, Jews and Gentiles alike, you're all sinners, you need a Savior. The ground's level at the foot of the cross. The only way anybody, a Jew or a Gentile, can have peace with God is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. There'll be one flock and one shepherd. He is our great shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep. This is who Jesus Christ is to you. Thirdly, notice what the God of peace will do in you. We've seen what he's done for you in Jesus Christ. We've seen who he is. But thirdly, notice what the God of peace will do in you in verse 21. May he equip you with everything good that you may do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ. If you go back and look at that verse as a whole, I, I, I just want you to see this. The main part of, that, of these two verses, uh, let me get back to where I can see all the verses together. If you take verse 20 and 22, 21, look, 20 and 21 together, here's the main sentence. Now, may the God of peace equip you with everything good that you may do his will. Working in us, so forth and so on. But that's the main heart of this long two-verse sentence. What the God of peace will do in you is that he will equip and empower you to walk in his will and please him. Isn't it amazing? God took care of all my sin and gave me Hope for eternity. But what he will do in me is equip me and empower me to walk in his will. Are you beginning to get the picture about your salvation? It's about Jesus and what he's done and will do in us. It's all about Jesus. Now, does that mean there's nothing for us to do in the Christian life? No, of course there is. But, it, but, but hear me. It means that, it means that whatever we do, it, it, it must be done in dependence on Him. And the fact is, the only reason we can do anything is because of His power. We sang about it earlier. Our God will equip and empower you to walk in His will and to please Him. Hebrews 10, verses 12 to 14, we read at the beginning of the service, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until His enemies should be made a footstool for His feet. For by a single offering, He has perfected for all time. That's our justification. Our declaration, the declaration before God's bar of justice that we have been made righteous, that our, our sins have been forgiven. But not only that, we've been, posit we've been credited with positive righteousness. We've been given all of the righteousness and holiness of Jesus. We've been justified. He's perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And that's another way of saying what he says here in verse 21. He's, he, he will equip us with everything good that we may do his Will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Who's doing all the work? The God of peace. He's equipping you with everything good that you may do his will. Now you you're involved, you do his will. But don't ever forget it's him who's working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. It reminds me a lot of Philippians 2, 12 and 13, where Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Here's the command. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We have a responsibility to do just that. To work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. For, verse 13, it is God who works in you both to will and to work 
For His good pleasure. Why do you want to and how can you do His good pleasure? Because He's the one working those desires and that power in you. He's the one equipping and empowering you to do that. But when you have the desire and know what to do, Paul says, do it. Work it out. And work it out with fear and trembling. Why? Because here's the deal, guys. Do you understand what the Christian life is? It's, it's a supernatural life. Or at least it ought to be. Uh, the biblical Christian life is just that. It's a supernatural life. Because it is God who is at work in you both to want to and to be able to do His good pleasure. So the whole time I'm doing my part in obeying God, asking God to help me obey Him and then taking those steps of faith in the moment and obeying Him, I should tremble to know that the whole reason any of that's happening is because he's at work in me. That's why we do it with fear and trembling. To think that God himself is working in my heart and my life and allowing me to be just a fraction of something of the beauty of Christ in this world. To love somebody with just a just a shadow of the love that Jesus loved me with. But truly a shadow, and, 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 and in a way that communicates the beauty of Jesus. It's phenomenal. What has the God of peace promised to do in you? This is what he's promised to do. To equip and empower you to walk in his will and please him. Well, fourth. This morning, and in the last point, verse 21, who gets all the glory? Who is it that gets all the glory? Verse 21 says, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, Jesus Christ is the only one worthy of all glory forever and ever. When someone looks at your Christian life, it ain't about you. <laughs> Newsflash. If you ever see anything that looks like Jesus, remotely like Jesus to me, it ain't about me. I'm a jar of clay. You're a clay pot. It's the treasure in us. It's Christ that you see who's working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure and enabling us to actually walk that out, work that out in our lives. And therefore, he gets all the glory. I pray that if there's anything at my funeral, if there's anything good said, that Christ will get the glory. And by the way, let me just go ahead and say, we need to be real careful about those people that have, have, even those people that have walked most faithfully with the Lord, that we don't give them the glory. Hello? Y'all okay? I'm thankful. I, I've, I've got a litany of relatives, a mother, a father, grandparents, that God mightily used in my life. They were, they were godly people. They loved Jesus. They showed me Christ. But here's the deal. Grandma was a vessel for Jesus. The good I saw in grandma was Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And Elma Cox, who is with Jesus right now, would have it no other way. Because like she's never seen him, she's seeing him now. And she knows she was just a jar of clay in this world. She knows she didn't ever deserve any glory or honor. Only Christ deserves the glory and the honor because it's all of him. It's all of him. Jesus gets all the glory. All that God has done and will do for us is aimed at the glory of his son, Jesus Christ, through whom he accomplished our salvation from beginning to end. You could go to Ephesians 1 and see it there again, but the point of salvation for you and me is the glory of Christ. Always. And so we see... 
from these, this simple benediction. God will equip and empower us to do His will if we'll ask Him and pursue obedience. The author of Hebrews wraps this letter up and says, Hey, remember who Jesus is. Don't forget who He is and live like it. And I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God will equip and empower you to do His will through Jesus Christ. He'll empower you through Christ who lives in you to do His will. The author of Hebrews, as he closes in, with this prayer, he's, he's thinking back to these folks that, that were struggling. They were thinking about going back to Judaism. They were thinking about going, going back to the Old Covenant. And he just reminds them, don't go back. Church of Jesus Christ in America and at East LJ Baptist Church, there's nowhere else to go. Jesus is better. And only Christ can save. So fix your eyes on him. Don't quit running. When the going gets tough, strengthen those knees. Strengthen those arms, raise them up, keep pumping, and keep running. And in the middle of that, remember, he's the one that will give those legs energy to keep running. He's the one that will give your heart the desire to make it all the way home. Faithful, persevering in your faith. It's fitting that we come to the Lord's table together this morning and be reminded again of all that God has done for us in Jesus and celebrate like never before as well as ask Him at this table to equip and empower us to obey Him in order that He may be glorified in our midst and in our daily lives. Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 23 talks about this sacrifice that we'll celebrate in just a moment. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, His body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You may be here this morning and you're wavering. It's been a hard week. There's been things that happened that have caused you to doubt. There's been, there's, life's coming at you hard. There's been just, just experiences that, um, that, that, just, that just make it hard to fo- keep following Jesus. You, 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 maybe you've begun to doubt. Is it all even true? Maybe you're struggling with the sacrifices that are necessary to say no to sin and yes to obedience. Whatever it is, hear the word of God. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. He hasn't lied to you. He's never done you wrong. And he'll do for you tomorrow everything he's promised to do. And you have a new and living way open that you can draw near to him. Check it with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Why? Because God did what he said he would do in Jesus. He paid it all, and he raised him from the dead. He lives. Your Savior lives and reigns over all things. And, he, and, he, and he, the Hebrew says, he ever lives to make intercession for you. This is the one to whom you come. This is how he's allowed us to come. We celebrate this sacrifice this morning.